Okay, I think we are ready to start. So I am Dr. Sohela Chima. I am the Assistant Dean for the Institute for Population Health here at Weill Cornell Medicine in Qatar. And I'm also an Associate Professor of Clinical Population Health Sciences here. So I want to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you joining us from different parts of the world. So assalamu alaikum or good evening or good morning wherever you are joining us uh, from different parts of the world. We are very, very excited for today's session. It's a very, very common topic, but a very, very important topic, uh, I, I think. And we have a great speaker lined up for today. So I'm really excited about the talk. So as you know, this is the Health and You Community Wellness Series. And the overall goal of the series is really to create you know, that community awareness about health and disease, and as you know, if you have not attended before, the ultimate really objective of the series is we wanna really enhance self-care. We wanna reduce suffering, improve the quality of life and increase healthy longevity. As a reminder, some housekeeping, your cameras and microphones have been turned off. You can use the question and answer feature to type the questions or comments you can even post them in the chat for us because we will be able to see those questions. You know, we will address at the end of the session and I will help moderate the question and answer session. And again, as a reminder, this is not a CME CPD activity and no certificates of attendance will be issued. So here we are, uh, we have a very great speaker today, a great colleague also, Dr. May Mahmood. Uh, I would like to introduce her. It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Mahmoud. She is the, uh, she's an assistant dean for faculty affairs, also an associate professor of teaching in medicine, and also the director for student academic advising here at Weill Cornell Medicine in Qatar. Dr. Mahmoud is American board certified in internal medicine and geriatrics, and she practices as a consultant at Hamad Medical Corporation. So Dr. Mahmoud received her medical degree uh, from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Khartoum in Sudan. And she continued her training there. Then she moved onwards to Canada where she completed her licensing exams for both Canada and the US. Uh, thereafter, she completed an internship and residency at State University of New York. And prior to joining Cornell and Qatar in 2006, Dr. Mahmoud also completed a fellowship in geriatric medicine at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center. She has also completed a Master of Education in Health Professions from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Mahmoud is a fellow at the American College of Physicians. She serves on several national Qatar research and organizational committees, and her research interests include medical education, particularly the areas of assessment of clinical competencies and academic integrity. Dr. Mahmoud, a very, very warm welcome to you and over to you. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Chima, for the introduction and for the invite. I'm very happy to be with all of you uh, to discuss this very important and very common uh, medical condition, uh, hypertension or high blood pressure. Okay, so I have uh, nothing to disclose. And this is the outline of my presentation. So some introduction, some definition, we will talk about how you measure blood pressure, how to avoid complications and uh, treatment options. So first introduction, if you are diagnosed with high blood pressure, or hypertension, you are not alone, is the most common reason for office visit. So in my clinic, if I see 12 patients uh, per clinic, more than half of them, I would say maybe seven or eight patients will come for blood pressure control. So it's very, very common. Lifetime risk for those between, between ages 20 and 85 years was 83% or around 84% for men and around 69% for women. And this is US data, but globally, worldwide, it affects only five to 30% of adults. I saw UK data, uh, is, they say one in third uh, patients or adults have diagnosis of hypertension or high blood pressure. 
is one of the leading causes of the global burden of disease because of medication and uh, sick leave from working days. It, the estimated burden uh, financially is around $45 uh, billion. This is again US data. It's projected to increase to 60% in 2025, which is coming soon. Uh, mostly in the developing countries, 80% of the increase will happen in the developing countries. The good news is the most common modifier risk, modifiable risk factor for heart and kidney diseases, as we will see in the presentation. A bit of a history which I found uh, interesting. Uh, people thought about the cardiovascular circulation and blood pressure for a long time, thousands of years ago. Uh, William Harvey in 1628, uh, he's a doctor, he described the cardiovascular system and how it works, and he actually developed it or built it on uh, Ibn Nafis, who described the pulmonary circulation uh, before him. In 1733, uh, the first blood pressure was measured in a horse and by a device that invasively put inside the artery and they call it the force of blood. Then 100 years later, uh, sphygmomographic devices uh, start to appear. In late 1800, early 1900, the uh, introduction of a sphygmomanometer in clinical medicine, this is the device we measure the blood pressure with. And as every time we have a new technology, there are some uh, critics and some skeptics publish this in uh, British Medical Journal. We popularize our senses and weaken uh, clinical acuity. They did not predict what technology will, uh, will uh, bring after that. So they like to use their hands. They did not like uh, any intervention from uh, a device to tell about the patient. Um, in 1849 to 1884, essential hypertension, a term which we will know about later, was described by Frederick uh, Akbar Muhammad in the UK. And then in 1905, uh, 1905 Kortikov described the sounds which we hear when we measure uh, blood pressure. These are some of the devices that uh, we used in the past here, and this is a new one. Now you can even monitor it by, uh, by your phone, something you can wear and you can monitor. So we came a long way. So this is just a reminder, the circulation, the, how the blood pump, the blood to the body through the arteries and uh, the blood come from the uh, body to the heart, the red represent the arteries, the blue represent the veins, and the high blood pressure or hypertension usually represented by two numbers. You hear this all the time from your doctor. Uh, the top one is the systolic blood pressure, what we call it systolic blood pressure, and the pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the heart contract. And the bottom one, we call it diastolic, is the pressure in the arteries when the heart relaxes. Uh, increase in both the systolic and diastolic, or in, only in, in either one above this number, the magic number is 120 over 80, is called hypertension. So sometimes we have only one number increased and the second one is normal. This is one we call isolated. So if the top one, the systolic is increased, but the bottom one is normal, a condition we see most common in elderly, we call it isolated hypertension. If the opposite happened, the top one is normal, the bottom one is elevated, we call it isolated uh, diastolic hypertension. And this is more common in younger people. We know that blood pressure fluctuate during the day for normal people and also for people diagnosed with high blood pressure. Usually it lower down uh, when we rest during sleep, the blood pressure should go down. This is just uh, what- Blood pressure is the force the circulating blood exerts. Can you hear the sound? Yes. Okay. So it's just describe what I mentioned, uh, how we measure the blood pressure and what is the systolic and diastolic number means. On the walls of blood vessels. 
it is different in different types of vessels, but the term blood pressure, when not specified otherwise, refers to arterial pressure in the systemic circulation. When the heart contracts and pumps blood into the aorta during systole, the aortic pressure rises, and so does the systemic arterial pressure. The maximum pressure following an ejection is called the systolic pressure. In between heartbeats, when the ventricles refill, blood pressure falls to its lowest value called the diastolic pressure. These... Yeah. So, high blood pressure or hypertension, again, the number or the magic number you want to memorize is 120 over 80. Elevated blood pressure, uh, when we see the top number is more than 20 to 20 to 129 or the diastolic is still below 80. Hypertension, there is two stages. A stage one, when we see the systolic between 130 to 139 and the, or diastolic between 80 or 89. Either one qualify for the stage. And stage two, systolic at least more than 140 or diastolic at least 90 millimeter of mercury. This is according to 2017 American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association uh, definition and uh, description guidelines uh, that came, uh, at, which is different from uh, old guidelines and also different from um, um, NICE and European um, and, and uh, International Association. I gave this talk a few years ago, and the cutoff to diagnose hypertension was a little bit higher than that. 140 over 90 was considered hypertension. Uh, below that is considered prehypertension, and stage two is up to 160. This changed uh, because uh, people did the meta-analysis for um, observation studies and clinical trials. And they found that even lower number in the 130, 139 range, 140 range associated with increased cardiovascular risk. So these are new number and uh, people now are using these numbers. The higher value determine the stage, as I mentioned. But before we diagnose hypertension, before we say this is elevated or stage one or stage two, very, very important, we have to make sure that we measure the blood pressure in the right way. So I know in Hamid, for example, uh, most of patients, uh, even if you are coming for a different reason, you park far away, you may have a fight or something in the way, you come, you take the stairs or you take the elevator, you come to the clinic, you've been asked to come to check your vital signs and most of the time, sometimes the vital signs, the blood pressure are, are high. The ideal way, to check blood pressure is you have to make the patient sit for at least five minutes. They are not supposed to be talking. They're supposed to be relaxed. Their arm, their back, and their feet supposed to be supported, especially the arm. The cuff size should be the right size. Uh, we have in adult, we have a small, we have average one that's commonly used in the clinic. And we have large size for uh, big people. So the, the right size has to have to be used. We usually, if we find the blood pressure high, we, you, we uh, measure it in both arm. And uh, if somebody has high blood pressure and they have differences in their reading from uh, right or left, they should measure their blood pressure all the time on the arm that give higher reading. We measure it twice. Again, if we see high blood pressure, we ask the people, people to relax, person to relax, and uh, we measure it again. This is how we measure it again. So we put the stethoscope um, uh, in, in the hospital. Now we use electronic one, but if you have something like this at home, uh, we, we inflate the cuff till the heart uh, beat stop because the artery, because the um, artery compressed the blood. So we don't hear any sound. And then we start to deflate the cuff slowly till we hear the sound. This is what we call Korokov sound. If you remember from my previous, uh, from my first slide from the history, he's the one who described 
uh, the sounds. So when we hear the first sound, this is what we call the systolic uh, blood pressure. We, re we realize the number that the sound start, uh, we start to hear the sound. And then we continue to deflate slowly till the heart sound disappear. Um, and that's what we call the diastolic um, blood pressure. So how do we check uh, blood pressure? Um, the recommendation now by all societies, uh, professional societies, that adult 18 years of age and older, they should check uh, their blood pressure, at least annually. Every time you come to a hospital for a visit, doesn't have to be related to high blood pressure or hypertension, you should get your uh, blood pressure checked. Uh, is easy and quick and doesn't cost any money. So uh, it's recommended that every time you go to the hospital, you get your blood pressure checked. Adults with risk factor for high blood pressure, for example, uh, patients with obesity, or at any point in their life, they were, they were told that their blood pressure is above normal. They should go for blood pressure check more often, like maybe every six months. Once we have diagnosed somebody with having high blood pressure, assuming that we did the right uh, measure for blood pressure, we uh, usually want to repeat that in the office sometime. For example, when patients come to me and I realize they have blood pressure, I, uh, after in the middle of the uh, visit, I uh, ask them to check the blood pressure again, just to make sure that the blood pressure stays the same or uh, drop or there is a component of moving around and uh, stress um, while you're coming to the hospital. We also, uh, we try to confirm it by two things. We try to also measure blood pressure at home and uh, we have, we can choose to send patient home with a device that they wear for 24 hours. And when they come back, we uh, get the reading for the 24 hours or we can ask them to uh, measure blood pressure at home uh, twice a day in the morning, in the evening for a week. And we see them again to uh, check the blood pressure reading. Um, after COVID, um, we stopped doing the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring uh, the, for the device, but we ask patients to do blood pressure, to check blood pressure at home and they come with their reading. If a person has no blood pressure machine at home or they cannot afford to buy one, we ask them to go to a primary health center um, at least once a day or maybe twice or three times a week uh, for blood pressure uh, check. And then we, they come to see us. Sometimes we have to start treatment immediately. Uh, if somebody has severe uh, blood pressure uh, uh, elevation or hypertension, uh, which define as uh, the top number is more than 180 or the bottom is less more than 120, we treat immediately or even if it's lower, but there is an obvious problem uh, that the chronic elevation of the blood pressure is causing. Uh, for example, we do ECG, if we see there is enlargement of their heart chamber, uh, or there is any problem uh, we can detect, uh, we will um, start medication immediately. Sometimes, and I had this uh, patient uh, in my last clinic, she came for uh, something, um, I don't remember, I think uh, GERD or reflux or something like that. But when, I, when she came in, I noticed her blood pressure is high. So her systolic is more than 160. And when I look at her, um, visits in the hospital. She sees uh, doctors for different reasons. Her blood pressure is always, when checked in the hospital, is always in the 160 range. If that person has a uh, risk factor, for example, ob obesity, they have family history in, of uh, hypertension or blood pressure, I do feel comfortable starting them on blood pressure medication. So uh, the question, always people ask, what causes hypertension? Why do I get high blood pressure? So most people, more than 90% of people, we don't know why they get uh, high blood pressure. There are theories about genetics, uh, so it runs always in family, some environmental factors. Uh, age is very important. As we age, we get older, we have higher risk 
for developing uh, hypertension. And the prevalence increased from 28% for people, for younger people, 20 to 44 years, to more than 77% for people more, more than uh, 65 years of age. We also know obesity, sedentary lifestyle, excessive salt intake, excessive alcohol intake, smoking, psychosocial stress, all these factors uh, make people more uh, prone to develop hypertension. But the real truth, maybe five people have the same uh, profile in terms of genetic and environment. Uh, one person get hypertension, the other person doesn't get hypertension. Uh, and that's why we say, uh, we don't know why people get hypertension. These are some factors, our series associated with hypertension. We know that decreased risk by lifestyle, uh, uh, we can decrease the risk for hypertension by uh, change of, in lifestyle modification, which is not easy. Um, this again, just illustration of uh, many factors that affect uh, hypertension and people develop hypertension. Very few people, less than 10%, they, they have a reason or they have a cause uh, for their hypertension and we call it secondary hypertension. And these are potentially reversible if you are able to correct it. The most common causes for this secondary hypertension uh, are the kidney diseases and drugs. Kidney diseases is like a vicious circle. People get diseases from the kidney, either from primary kidney disease um, for whatever reason, or from the renal arteries, uh, the arteries that supply uh, the kidneys, there is a stenosis. That causes high blood pressure, and we will know later high blood pressure also affect the kidney, so it becomes like a, a vicious circle. Uh, drugs, if they are used um, in, as chronic in chronic basis, like NSAIDs, NSAIDs like um, uh, ibuprofen, which is Advil, or Aleve, Naproxen, or um, Voltaren, if we use this for long term, uh, it can be a cause for hypertension. Uh, oral contraceptive pills, steroids, if we use it for medical reason, it make people uh, hypertensive, antidepressants, uh, and, and many drugs. I, uh, one of the things we do, if somebody is taking drugs, we check if, we, if it's not uh, one of the common uh, drugs we use, we check if it's, it can be contributing to people high blood, high blood pressure. Other causes are rare, but we also, uh, investigate or look for them. Uh, if there is suspicion, Cushing syndrome, people usually, their feature uh, may uh, hint us towards the, the diagnosis. Usually people have moon faces, they have abdominal obesity, stri, and this usually is secondary to tumor, whether it's benign or malignant uh, in the adrenal glands or sometimes in the pituitary uh, gland. Thyroid and parathyroid disorders, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, those are the people who uh, usually obese, um, they snore when they sleep and they, they stop breathing for some time uh, when they are sleeping. Uh, coarctation of the aorta, uh, clinically we, we suspect it when we see differences in blood pressure when we measure in the right and left uh, arm. Uh, and this is means the coarctation or, or the narrowing of the aorta uh, is up when the aorta leaving the heart, or it could be uh, down after the aorta goes to the chest and abdomen. This is give us difference in blood pressure between the arm and the leg. It's very common in children uh, when they have blood pressure, we look for it. Illicit drug like cocaine and amphetamines, um, also another cause for uh, hypertension. We don't usually look for causes for secondary hypertension unless we have suspicion or we have a reason. If we see abnormal labs or uh, if we see, for example, very young people, they don't have any family history or very old, when of a sudden they develop high blood pressure, uh, we start think of secondary causes. Or maybe somebody is taking uh, two medications or three medications and not uh, their blood pressure is still uncontrolled. We try to think of uh, secondary causes. Sometimes patients, uh, they have controlled blood pressure for many years, 
and one of a sudden their blood pressure is out of control, we start think of uh, secondary causes. But for most people, we just uh, diagnose as primary hypertension. Other factors affecting regulation of blood pressure, uh, sodium, because uh, as we will see uh, in the coming slides, uh, volume affect the, the, uh, the pressure. Uh, any sympathetic overflow, any adrenaline also affect the pressure. Uh, increase in vascular resistance, the running angiotensis system, system, which I will discuss later. So the blood pressure determined uh, by this is, I apologize a little bit of uh, physiology, but I think it's important to understand uh, uh, hypertension. Um, is determined by uh, the equation of cardiac output and peripheral resistance. The cardiac output is uh, defined as how much uh, blood the heart pump to the body in one minute. And the peripheral resistance, of course, uh, it means that the flow of the blood in the vessels, if they find any resistance. The cardiac output itself is deter determined by the volume of blood we pump every time the heart contract. And every time the heart contract is the heart rate. The normal heart rate is between 60 to 100 for, for most people. So you can imagine per minute. You can imagine if you if you your heart pump at 60, you probably uh, your cardiac output will be less, and if your heart pump be, uh, beating or contracting at 100 per minute, your cardiac output will be high. The the volume depends on, on other factors. I don't want to um, mention here. Uh, um, the peripheral resistance affected by the volume, uh, atherosclerosis, especially for elderly, and, and the flow. Um, these are important to understand because, for example, some of the medication we treat uh, hypertension with is uh, beta blocker, something that affects the heart rate or something affect the, the, the vessel's uh, dilatation. So from what we said, any increase in any of these factors will end up uh, for patient's uh, blood pressure to be increased. Also, uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, what we call RAS, is extremely important um, to understand. I will just uh, say it briefly. Um, our body work as a unit, so and they support like a team team uh, work. So the fluid in the body and the sodium um, is controlled or monitored by many organs. For example, if the when the kidney sense that uh, there is low fluid coming to the kidney or there is low sodium coming to the kidney, immediately it produce uh, uh, renin and renin work on changing uh, angiotensinogen to angiotensin one, uh, which is angiotensinogen produced in the liver come to the circulation, it changed to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1, uh, it changed to angiotensin 2 by something called uh, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, is produced in the endothelial cells in the lung and the kidneys. And angiotensin 2 affect the brain. It gives us sense of you have to drink water. We need more water. It affects on the hormone of ADH. It affects on the kidney to absorb more water, the adrenal to secrete hormone called aldosterone. And aldosterone work in the kidney to reserve more sodium and with sodium also come uh, water. These are important because many of our drugs, the newer drug uh, that we treat hypertension with, they work on this system. We have drugs that inhibit renin, renin inhibitors, we have drugs like uh, enalapril, lisinopril, captopril. Those are angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors work here. Uh, we have uh, drugs like Cozar, uh, Diovan, um, uh, Aprovel. These are un called angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, they work here in this side. And we have also aldactone that work on the aldosterone inhibitor. Aldactone. So many drugs work in this system. 
and um, important to know. So how do we diagnose hypertension? Any healthcare professional can tell you uh, if you have high blood pressure or normal blood pressure. Most of the time is incidental. So most of the time people don't have symptoms when they have blood pressure. And this is very important to understand because many patients stop taking their medication because they say, we feel fine. We don't, we don't need medication or uh, they start medication and then the blood pressure control, it become normal. And then they feel like we stop taking the medication because we, we don't need it. It's different from other diseases. The, the, the most common one is diabetes. People with diabetes usually feel symptoms. They feel they lose weight, they urinate a lot, they drink a lot. People with hypertension, they can just feel normal uh, till uh, sometimes, God forbid, they come with complications. They come with a stroke. And I have seen patients in their 40s come with uh, severe stroke and ending up with uh, paralysis. Uh, some they come with symptoms or they feel symptoms like and with general symptoms you cannot even attribute to high blood pressure that's why people tend to ignore it like headaches dizziness fatigue sometimes palpitations um, or uh, because hypertension or high blood pressure in chronic uh, on chronic basis it affects the brain the kidneys the heart or the eyes so sometimes patients present with uh, complications of chronic hypertension undiagnosed. Um, so many times when the resident or a medical student uh, present a patient and they will say uh, he has no history of blood pressure or hypertension, I will ask when was the last time that they seen a physician or they went to a clinic to get their blood pressure checked. Other types or other terminology that you may hear about hypertension or high blood pressure. Uh, there is resistant hypertension, and this is when sometimes we see people taking more than three medications, uh, but still their blood pressure is not controlled. Um, and there is something called white coat hypertension. Uh, it means that blood pressure reading persistently with the normal at home, but high in clinics. So they tell you, we, we measure blood pressure at home is always normal, but when they come to the clinic, it's, it's always elevated. There is risk of developing hypertension for these people, and there is questionable or query increased risk for cardiovascular uh, uh, event. The opposite of white coat hypertension is called mask hypertension. These people, their blood pressure reading persistently within normal in office, in clinics, but high in out of office uh, uh, places. For these two people, the mask for all these people or three hypertension, uh, uh, whether it's uh, resistant or white coat or mask, uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring will be very, very useful because it measures blood pressure within 24 hours and it give, you, it give us sense of how their blood pressure is being. Uh, we diagnose hypertension if there is mean more than 125 over 75. This is again number reduced from before. It used to be 135 over 85. So the number is now lower. Uh, we want to see also dipping, uh, lowering of the blood pressure during night because this is important. Um, um, this is, these are the, the uh, hypertension that we feel ambulatory blood pressure is important. Uh, sometimes we see patient with severe high blood pressure and those people need, for example, uh, intensive care admission uh, because we, uh, we want, want to avoid complications or outcome uh, from that. Um, hypertensive urgency, when we see really high blood pressure, like uh, systolic more than 180 or the systolic more than 120, um, and patient is asymptomatic, they don't have any problem with their eyes, their heart, or their kidneys. When they have problem with these organs, we call it emergency, hypertensive emergency. If they have a stroke or they have a heart problem or they have a renal problem, we call it emergency. So those people need intensivist uh, follow-up and we try to reduce their blood pressure slowly by uh, in the hospital and with, with cautions. 
and they need a special uh, treatment. But just in case you hear uh, the term. So why we care? Uh, we keep talking about hypertension and the types and uh, uh, how to measure it. Uh, we care because hypertension um, is very important for uh, the cardiovascular risk, which is number one cause of this uh, in the world. Uh, so hypertension, if it's not treated, it can cause uh, increase in size of the heart. It can cause heart attack, uh, like myocardial infarction. It can cause heart failure. And uh, people say for every increase of blood pressure of 20 systolic or 10 diastolic, uh, the risk of this from heart disease or stroke doubled. Uh, so it's very important uh, risk factor for heart disease. Uh, the pressure in the vessels, the wear and tear uh, phenomena is also uh, causes aneurysm and aneurysm are a serious condition when they rupture. Uh, this is just a graph to show um, a, a cumulative effect of cardiovascular risk factors. So the reference here are uh, women, average women, 50 years of age who are not diabetic. They don't have any problem with cholesterol and they are measuring their blood pressure, uh, the range here at 110 to 170. And in the Y axis, their absolute risk for, for cardiovascular disease. So you can see, for example, if they, their total cholesterol is more than 270, their risk for cardiovascular disease increase. And if they are a smoker also increase, and if, they are, uh, if their HDL, this is the good cholesterol is low, their risk increase. Male increase more, diabetes increase more, age more than 60 increase more. So it's very important uh, risk factor. For the brain, a stroke, uh, hyper, high blood pressure is important factor in causing a stroke. Uh, two types, either ischemic, which is blockage of the arteries to the brain, or hemorrhage when the, the vessels rupture. Also associated with cognitive decline and uh, encephalopathy, which is change in mental status, but no clinical problem. Kidneys, again, uh, causes damage in the kidney and maybe number one cause for a kidney disease uh, or kidney failure. But at the same time, the good news is the most uh, pre uh, prevalent modifiable risk factor for uh, premature cardiovascular disease. So all we need to do is to treat it and make sure our blood pressure is always under control. Uh, the goal is blood pressure is low 130 over 80 for most um, uh, non-drug or non-pharmacological uh, uh, option. I will go a bit fast because I think that we are running out of time. Uh, so this is the lifestyle modification. If we can do, if somebody blood pressure is mildly elevated, we can give them a trial of three months to try this salt restriction less than 1.5 gram, um, decreased blood pressure by uh, 4.8 over 2.5. This is of course uh, average. Um, avoid salty food and processed food. What I tell my patients is when they cook, they can add little salt, when, but when they put the food on the table, they should not add any salt. Uh, salt uh, processed food, canned food, of course, is obvious to people. Salty food, how do we know the food is salty? I, I tell my patients, any food that make you thirsty after you eat it by like uh, 30 minutes is salty food. It means that you eat a lot of salt. DASH diet uh, is uh, associated with reduced blood pressure, uh, systolic by six, diastolic by four. And what is DASH diet? Is a uh, diet rich of uh, vegetable fruits, and low fat dairy products, whole grain, uh, poultry, fish, and nuts, and low in red meat and, and fat. Uh, weight loss, any weight, any one kilogram, uh, you lose the blood pressure decrease by 0.5 to two. Uh, aerobic exercise, uh, up to 50 minutes per week, decrease blood pressure by uh, four to six over three, smoking cessation, of course, reduce alcohol intake to do two drinks per day for man, men and one for women, one drink for women. And the drink roughly is 12 ounces of beer, uh, five ounces of wine and 1.5 ounces of liquor. 
medications, we have many, cyazide diuretics, we have calcium channel blockers, uh, we have angiotensin converting enzymes, I mentioned earlier, angiotensin two receptor blockers, we have beta blockers, alpha blockers, centrally acting blockers, renin inhibitors, these are the classes of medication. Uh, uh, how we choose what drug to for the patient, of course, we have to make sure we take full history, we know what other conditions the patient have. For example, if they have diabetes, we know what the best medication to, to give them. If they have kidney disease, we know what medication to give them. If they have something like uh, migraine, we know what medication to give. So sometimes we give one drug, sometimes we start with two medications if the patient has uh, a state two. For older people, um, we used to say blood pressure more than around 150 is okay. Recent studies uh, showed that we should also treat them aggressively. Uh, so unless there is a comorbidities or frail patients or they have limited life expectancy, we be more liberal with controlling the blood pressure. But for healthy elderly person who's uh, working and uh, exercising and uh, independent on their activities, you should uh, be careful with their blood pressure. So uh, this is like a summary. Uh, um, your role as a, a person or a patient diagnosed with hypertension or a person want to avoid hypertension because everybody in your family has hypertension. Uh, have a healthy habit, uh, work with doctor to control your blood pressure. So keep your appointments. Um, you may change your blood pressure in every visit, increase, decrease, or add another one. Uh, most people need medications for life. So please don't stop taking your medicine unless you're instructed by your physician. If your blood pressure is controlled or normal, it's because you are taking medicine, not because uh, just uh, you don't need the medication. Medications are individualized. Please don't share. Many times my patient tell me I took medicine from my sister or my husband. Don't share because we, uh, doctors decide on medication based on your condition. And also the dose doesn't mean that this medication is more aggressive or less aggressive than the other. Like, because every medication is different. Like in, in the same class, uh, we have a uh, therapeutic dose or the dose that we know it works. Uh, 50, for example, for uh, losartan. We have valsartan is 80. We have uh, herbasartan 150. So it doesn't mean that 150 is more strong than 50. It's just the, the, class, the class of the medication is different. Keep your doctor appointment, read and educate yourself about the disease as any other chronic diseases. You have to educate yourself and you have to be on top of your uh, uh, condition. And finally, thank you for listening. And uh, I hope you enjoy the workup. Stay active and watch the matches. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. May, for that wonderful presentation. If I can please ask you to stop share and then we will go ahead. Okay, great. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we've, we have some questions coming in and some which I also have. Uh, so again, Dr. May, I think a great topic, and I think you addressed it very nicely, very, very important topic, but I think some of the key messages which you gave right at the end, I would like to repeat those for people where, you know, we don't want to share medications, definitely not for any disease that, you know, somebody might be taking, or sometimes what happens is that, you know, if a family member or a friend has some medication, they keep it, and you think you have similar symptoms, you know, people start taking those medication. So please, uh, you know, don't do that. Again, go to your physician, get your health checkups. Uh, like Dr. May said, a lot of the times high blood pressure is silent. So we have to be really, really careful. And again, she explained very nicely what it can lead to and why is it important that we should be controlling our blood pressure. So Dr. May, first question, you know, I will ask you if you can just again review, you know, at what levels of um, systolic and diastolic blood pressure should people start medication? If you could just reiterate that again, because I think uh, that there might be a little bit of confusion. And again, like you said, the guidelines have been revised now. 
So uh, please, if you can just review those again, the levels that we should be starting medications. Yeah, so if you are following the American College of Physicians uh, of Cardiology and American Heart Association, the number, the normal or the magic number you need to memorize is 120 over 80. Again, the, the top one is the systolic blood pressure. The bottom one is the diastolic blood pressure. 120 mm -hmm. over 80 is the um, number you want to memorize. If the systolic rise to 129 and the diastolic is still 80, that's condition we call elevated blood pressure, but is not yet hypertension. If you have this condition, maybe the best thing to do is to do lifestyle modification, like right. exercise, decreased salt intake, um, weight loss, and, and all that. If the blood pressure is between 130 to 139, or the diastolic between 80 and 89, this is the stage one uh, uh, hypertension. And with the lifestyle modification, you have to take medication, assuming that um, you try the, the lifestyle modification, your blood pressure is still in, the, in that range, you need medication. Maybe one medication is enough uh, at that stage. The, the stage two is uh, blood pressure more than 140 and the stolic more than 90. So the top one, 40, the, the bottom one, 90. Sometimes we give two medications from two different classes. Sometimes we give one pill, but one pill has two medications. So also you have to uh, be, uh, make sure that are you taking one medicine or you're taking two medicine in one pill. I also uh, recommend for people to take picture. Now everybody has phone to take picture of the medications they take because sometimes uh, people come from outside, they go see doctors all over the places. And when they come and they tell me, I'm taking uh, the orange bill or the white yeah. bill or the small bill, or I, I, I say to them, I don't take the medications with you. So I don't know which, what, which yeah. one you are talking about. If you're taking picture uh, or, or write the names of the medication you are taking, it will be helpful for us. Wonderful tip. So please everybody develop, make a little album on your phone and take photos of all the medication and keep them because you could need that anywhere really, you know, at any time. So it's always good to have that. Uh, Dr. May, just as a continuation, you know, regarding medication, there are questions about what is the best time to take the blood pressure medication? Is it night or morning, after food or before food? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I would say morning time. And I tell, because we tend to forget as human beings. So I tell patients, make it part of your routine. So what are the things you do every day in the morning? If right. for example, you drink water every day in the morning or you eat your breakfast every day in the morning, just put it in front of you. And when you do that thing, take it with you. Because the blood pressure tend to be uh, higher in, during the daytime because we have a stress, we have work, we go up and down. so. It's better to take it in the morning, but as long as you take it on time, because most medication work for 24 hours, as yeah. long as you take it on time, uh, it's, perfect. it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, a great tip, you know, because um, we do forget sometimes, you know, again, with the busyness of our lives, or oh, it just slips our mind. It's, it's good to keep, you know, wh whatever, to have a routine and sort of, you know, like Dr. May said, you know, if you're drinking water, keep your medication close to that. If you get up and you know you you see your side table or whatever it is, you know just things which will remind you to take that. So it's really really important. Doctor, may another question: um, What advice would you give to a person who may be starting a blood pressure medication? Right, because of course any new medication that you start with, what kind of maybe side effects you know could, should they watch out for? What advice would you give to them? Uh, the first advice I would say is to discuss with your physician uh, side effects of the medication you are taking. The most common side effects, because everything, even uh, Panadol, has side effects, has benefit and has side effects. So right. I would say discuss the side effects with your physician. See some medications, for example, like S inhibitor, which uh, are the uh, uh, lisinopril and enalapril or 
uh, medications. Sometimes if somebody has a problem with their arteries to the kidneys, uh, renal vessels, it can cause uh, worsening of their kidney function. So usually, uh, personally, when I start this medication, I ask patients to come within one month to check their kidney function. Sure. And uh, based on that, I may adjust the medication. But I think very important to, uh, to discuss that with your physician, uh, because, for example, we know uh, beta blockers uh, affect, for example, sexuality for men. So maybe it's not important for, it's not the best option for them. Right. right. Um, some people have migraine, beta blocker is good for them. So uh, it's always a question to discuss with uh, your um, physician before you commit to the drug. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. May, for that. So, um, so uh, we have one question from a participant who's saying that, you know, sometimes when we are sick, you know, our blood pressure might rise, but, you know, again, when we are over with that illness, that blood, you know, our blood pressure just becomes regular. Does that mean that, you know, we are hypertensive or, you know, maybe at risk for developing high blood pressure? Uh, it depends on the sickness, right? Yes. Uh, and and how, how bad is the blood pressure? So if it's mild increase and you have, for example, cold or you have pneumonia or something, I will say, just observe that. You don't need to take medication. But if right. the blood pressure is very high, uh, like more than 180 or more than 160, you have to be careful and monitor it more often. If it's persistent, I, I measure it today and measure it tomorrow. If it's persistent, I have to take medication or take measure to lower it down because we know acute rise of blood pressure, it can have a bad outcome. So right. it depends on the disease you have, you're having and the blood pressure number. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. May, for that. So just talking a little bit about monitoring the blood pressure, Dr. May, you refer to the term ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Can you just explain to the audience what that means, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? So it's a small device. Actually, I think in the UK is a routine that you cannot diagnose with high blood pressure before you have this ambulatory uh, okay. device. For us here, we use it in certain cases. Uh, we bring patient to the clinic. Okay. Uh, the nurses put the device. They ask you, you cannot shower for 24 hours. Uh, and then uh, do your regular uh, activities. You go to work, you sleep, you whatever you do, exercise, whatever you do normal. Right. And then you sleep. Uh, the following day, you come, they take the device from you. They connect it to the computer. It gives us readings. Right. Uh, for the blood pressure. And based on that, we decide, we check the mean, we check the uh, at night, the drop. And based on that, we decide whether you have blood pressure or not. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, Dr. May, can you also comment, you know, there are a lot of devices now available, you know, whereby people can take their blood pressure at home. There are wrist monitors and, you know, other cuffs, you know, where people can just do how uh, reliable are the readings that we get? Are they a good indicator of, you know, what the actual, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yes, uh, we have electronic devices now. People buy and measure their blood pressure at home. Yes. Uh, mostly they are good and they are reflecting of um, the real blood pressure. Okay. Um, assuming the heart rate is uh, regular. Sure. Uh, which most people have regular heart rate. If for people who have arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, which is the common arrhythmia also, or they can check their pulse. If they feel their pulse is not regular, is not coming on certain time, maybe the electronic will not be, will not give, um, will not give accurate answer. Sometimes right. when I see discrepancy, like big discrepancy, I ask patients to bring their uh, machine to yes. the office. And we compare because machines also need to be calibrated by the device and by the company. And right. every device is different. So make sure your device is well calibrated. Uh, and if we don't see difference between their home machine and our machine, then it's, 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 it's okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I think we have another, I mean, this is very specific, but you know, some attendee is asking us if a patient is hypertensive and taking tenormin medication and with it, the blood pressure is controlled, but two to three times, maybe the blood pressure reading is 150, 90. Is that something that happens, you know, regularly or what can, what can, how can the person address this? Um. I'm not sure if uh, one or two per day, one or two per month. So I think uh, if, if you are taking medication and tenormin, again, uh, when I was a medical student, uh, beta blocker used to be number one, uh, sure. uh, tenormin, number one right, drug right. that we give to people. Right. It's no longer the case. We don't give tenormin right. now as, as the first drug. Uh, right. But it's a good drug, and tenormine decreases the heart rate. If you remember my equation, decreasing the heart rate will decrease the, eventually the, the blood pressure. So if the blood pressure is not controlled, if you measure it at home and you see most of the reading, you have to take average. If you see most of the reading above 130 over 80, then maybe you need another medication. Usually we add. We don't, we don't uh, uh, change. We, we add more, more drug. Most people... Most people need more than two, two or three drugs to control their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have another question by uh, an attendee, but it's very specific. So see, if you have any specific questions which are related, really the best person to answer that would you would be your primary care physician. So we are here you know, to generally give you information and empower you. With, with information and knowledge. And, and you can go ahead and speak to your physician, you know, the next time uh, that you are there in a meeting with them about these things, but we are not here to give specific clinical advice, uh, you know, to the community because that will best be done by your physician. Uh, Dr. May, just a couple more questions. Uh, so uh, I know you mentioned that uh, pretty much if a person is diagnosed and, and they start on medication, generally they take it for life. Is there any kind of evidence, you know, to suggest that high blood pressure can be reversed? Uh, are you aware of any evidence or is there any evidence or is it just really where we are, once you develop it, you are basically trying to reduce or control the blood pressure? Um, if you remember the non-pharmacologic intervention, it will decrease uh, blood pressure. And right. especially weight loss, uh, every one kilo will decrease anywhere between 0.5 to 2 millimeter of mercury. Right. Yes. So with bariatric surgery nowadays, uh, people lose a lot of weight after right. surgery and they stop taking medication for high blood pressure and for diabetes also. Uh, yes, diabetes so also. That's the only, if, if you make some changes <laughs> in the uh, pharmacological, non-pharmacological intervention lifestyle, which is yes. uh, Dr. Chima's uh, uh, interest and expertise, uh, then yes, you, you, and, and if your blood pressure is in the elevation or stage one, elevated blood pressure or stage one, you can, you can stop, but you have to also be under uh, medical attention and you have your blood pressure checked regularly and make sure yeah. that your blood pressure is stay uh, normal. Yes. So again, key advice, you know, coming from the expert, of course, we also promote that, you know, look, look after yourselves, you know. Again, focus on th simple things which are in your control, which is, you know, your eating habits, move more, stress less, you know, sleep well. All these things are really, really going to benefit, uh, you know, your health in, in any and every way. Um, so, Dr. May, if I can now, I think we, uh, we've addressed all the questions. If I can just ask you to please summarize just a few key points from today's session that the, you know, our attendees can take away with, what would be those key points that they can take away, inshallah, to, you know, so that they can help regulate their blood pressure, you know, live healthy lives and, and look after themselves well? Yeah, so number one, uh, hypertension is very common. If you see the data worldwide, around 30% of people have problem yeah. with blood pressure. So make sure that when you go for a doctor visit, make sure you check your blood pressure and make sure to understand whether it is high or, or low or normal because I, the patient I treated last week, 
I noticed her blood pressure was high in all her visits and she was not in any blood pressure medication. She came for something completely different, but mm -hmm. if she is going to die from something, she will die from blood pressure, not the other thing she came for. Right. So be aware of the blood pressure problem that is common and uh, uh, make sure to, uh, you understand uh, yourself and be aware of the risk factors for blood pressure like uh, obesity and uh, eating salt and uh, uh, family history specifically. Once you are diagnosed, uh, please uh, commit yourself to lifestyle modifications, especially salt, uh, weight loss and exercise. It helps with many things, stress and, and, and blood pressure and many things. And uh, be regular with your medications. Don't change medications by yourself. Don't stop medications by yourself. Don't wait till you uh, run out from medication till, till you, you come a week after or a month after or two months after and say, I ran out and I don't have refill. You come to the hospital, anybody can write medication for you if you are taking medication for chronic diseases. Great. Excellent summary. Thank you so much, Dr. May. I think it's it's been a wonderful session and, and I'm sure the attendees have gained a lot and inshallah they will remember all these things that you've spoken to them. So uh, thank you again to you, Dr. May Mahmood, uh, for giving your time and for your expertise. I would like to thank all our attendees, you know, who've joined us today from different parts of the world. Uh,